um, agreeing to give the, the opening talk of the conference. I, I, I could not see any other any better person to do that as just just to give a one minute introduction. Like uh, as everyone knows, uh, Professor Perros was awarded the Nobel Prize last year for his contribution on blackboard physics. And uh, I think in particular the, the the first the first paper, gravitational collapse in space time singularity, is uh, is definitely one of my favorite paper to that I've read because it's a quite short paper, very uh, nicely written, very, quite simple once you understand it. And it's just uh, less than three pages, I think. Uh, it completely um, completely changed the, the course of one uh, field of research. I don't think this, is, uh, this applies to, to many other papers. So yeah, it's really an honor to, to have you to open this conference and um, yeah, I just leave you the floor. You have 40 minutes for the presentation. And Thank you. Uh, yeah, whenever you're ready, you, you can start. Well, I'm ready. Um, <clears throat> with regard to that paper, oh, that's the next, I guess I put down to get to the next one. Here we are. That's the diagram in the paper you referred to. I, I always regretted that I didn't use Charlie Misner's improvement over my argument in the paper. There is a part of the argument which is much better using a method that he introduced. I won't go into that now. But, uh, anyway, this describes the gravitational collapse. Time, as in is usual in my pictures, is going from the bottom to the top. And uh, we have a, an initial hypersurface, and then there's some material here. And the point is that you have a trapped surface, which the future of it is uh, the, you find that the boundary of the future converges and it's a stable condition so that if you vary it a bit, it doesn't destroy it. The idea is that the collapsed picture <clears throat> due to Oppenheimer and Snyder, which was a collapsing dust cloud, is very particular. The material in the dust cloud didn't have any pressure. It was completely spherically symmetric, which was the main point, uh, which meant everything was focused towards the center. <coughs> And uh, here you allow in irregularities, the thing can go anything you like. At the time, people thought that if you varied it a bit, you would not get a singularity. Things went switch around and coming out again, because there was a paper by Lifshitz and Kalatnikov, two Russians, that seemed to have disproved that singularities were generic. There happened to be a mistake in the paper. I didn't know about the mistake, which I think was seen by Belinsky later. But, uh, uh, I wasn't too put off by that. I just thought the arguments didn't convince me. And I then came up with this description showing you how formation of black holes, when you have a collapse to a point of no return, and that's something like here, the existence of the trapped surface, that is the normals to it are converging in all directions. The null normals are converging. I don't want to go into this particularly, the argument was that singularities are generic. That is to say, if you have energy which is never negative, or the flux of energy across light rays is neg never negative, then you will get this singular situation, as long as you have an evolution from a, an initial non-compact Cauchy surface. That was the idea. Uh, I gave a talk about this at King's College London in 1964, I think it was, and then I gave a repeat in, uh, in Cambridge in 1965. Stephen Hawking was at the repeat, not at the original talk. And he developed the arguments and applied them to the Big Bang mainly. So this was his contribution that he used the techniques I was using and generalized them in various ways, in clever ways, to show that the, if you had an uh, initial state, this is a cartoon of the evolution of the universe. Uh, I'm not supposing that the universe is spatially compact because I can, you see at the back, it sort of gets a bit frilly. So it's not necessarily assumed to be compact. I don't know why this is not showing in the big here. Here we go. Um, so it could go on forever. But the point is, can you make this solution irregular at the beginning and still have singularities? That was the argument. And using these techniques, Stephen was able to uh, and with using, we, we got together. He, he had several papers, and then we had a paper together showing that the Big Bang was also a generic situation. Actually, the situation is very different from the Big Bang. First of all, let me introduce 
what people normally do is to consider that in the really early universe, you have a thing called inflation. Uh, now I'm going to have to make this smaller again to get it onto the picture. Uh, this is, you notice it's somewhat similar to the picture of a hole. You get this exponential expansion in the remote future, which of course is the, what we now see, people call it dark energy. The observation of the universe is exponentially expanding. I'll come back to that later. But the question is that I want to raise, inflation or no inflation, what happens within the collapsing model? Now you see, we would normally expect in a collapsing model that there would be formation of black holes and these black holes would congeal and they would one, form one unholy mess. Not a nice clean singularity as we see here. This is the thing that puzzled me for a long time because the generic situation, black holes congealing, whether there's an infraton field or not, it doesn't make much difference in the reverse sense. It just get, doesn't get a look in really. Um, you certainly get singularities of a wild type nothing like what we seem to see with the Big Bang. So the idea is that we would see something like this. This is a generic situation. So it's certainly not generic. Even though the theorems apply and show you have a singularity in the generic situation, the singularity, the Big Bang, is nothing like this. This would be a great mass combination of white holes. And I puzzled about this for a long time. Um, it's all connected with the second law of thermodynamics. So let me say something about that. First of all, I want to indicate a difference between matter and gravitation. Here I'm looking, well, time is now going from left to right. The top three pictures represent a gas in a box or something like that. And I'm imagining it's a finite box. And then I have a little smaller box, which I open the box and all the gas is initially in the smaller box and it spreads out. So that the entropy is going up and the distribution is getting more and more uniform. So these things go together. But if this is, now I'm going to imagine the bottom three pictures, and here we're looking at a huge galactic scale box with a lot of stars in it. And these stars I'm imagining originally spread out, and then they will start to clump because of gravitational effects. And it's sort of going the other way around. That is to say, even though the time is going from left to right, entropy is going up from left to right, the clumping is quite the opposite. You see, for a gravitational situation, the clumping situation represents high entropy, whereas it's the other way around for a normal material. In fact, you see that I could have a black hole here, <clears throat> and with a black hole, because of the Bekenstein Hawking formula, tells you that the entropy goes shooting up enormously. So the puzzle is, in my way of thinking, the puzzle is why is it that we have a combination apparently of high entropy in the matter in the early stages, let me say a little bit more about that in a minute, and low entropy and the gravity. It's very strange. Um, in fact, it's even more striking than that because one of the early observations, I think with the Kobe satellite, was this picture of the microwave background, the temperatures, the, the intensity for various temperatures. And you see it follows very, very closely the Planck curve, in fact, much more closely than you might think, because the error bars here are multiplied by a factor of 500. So when you shorten them down by a factor of 500, the error bars have the curve in, within the incline of the curve. So you are seeing a, a really remarkable Planck curve. That tells us what we're looking at is thermal equilibrium. So that we really have in the very earliest, what, when we actually see something coming from radiation from coming to the universe, we actually see maximum entropy. And I always found this very puzzling because you go back and back in time, you'd expect the entropy to be going down and down according to the second law. You go down and down until the earliest thing you can see it's at a maximum. Of course, you might say the expansion of the universe is doing something. It's, it's not really, it's not altering the picture here. We do have a maximum entropy state of the material. However, it's not telling us that the gravity which is the key thing, is very strictly low. It's very uniform. Now, one way of saying it's uniform, and I'll come back to that. You see, here we have a situation it's not like. In singularities in the future, what you have is, it could be still vacuum, but you have the vial curvature, which is the part of the curvature left when you take up the 
the part due to the matter. I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. The vowel curvature gets very, very large. So it's very, very large here. Whereas in the actual universe, what we seem to see is the vial curvature going to zero. In the Big Bang models that people discuss in cosmology all the time, you have something where the vial curvature is certainly zero. It's conformally flat, which means the vial curvature is zero. Vial curvature is the conformal curvature. Let me say a little bit more about the vial curvature. Here I'm imagining an observer looking back. <clears throat> These are the light rays into the observer's eye, and you see the two forms of curvature, the Ritchie curvature, it's actually the trace-free part. The scalar curvature doesn't affect the light rays, but the Ritchie curvature produces this focus, positive focusing, light rays bending inwards, whereas the vial curvature is this complete distortion. That is to say, it's as much, it's stigmatism. You have as much inward focusing as you have outward focusing. And this is, distinguishes the vial curvature from the Ritchie curvature. The vial part is the conformal part. You can't get rid of it by conformal scalings. I'll say a lot more about conformal transformation shortly. Another way of thinking about it is the early observation of the uh, sun's distortion of the, of the field, the distant field of stars. And you could see the circular pattern would be distorted into an elliptical pattern but because of the bending of the light. It makes the signals seem to be a little further out because of the sun's field. And this pushes everything outwards. Of course, it pushes it out a little bit less for the more distant part than it does for the earlier part, whereas the radial parts of it gets extended outwards. So you see a circular shape becomes elliptical. That's exactly what I'm talking about. And in the case of um, material dropping, you can see the vial curvature also affects time like rays, giving you this distortion effect. Now, I must, the point I'm trying to make here is that there is something very strange about the initial state of the universe. That is that the singularity in the Big Bang is really very, very unlike the singularities in the Big Bang. So in, in the singularities in black holes. Singularities in black holes, and as the corrected version of the Lifshitz and Kalatnikov paper, the Belinsky Lifshitz Kalatnikov paper, and Charlie Misner also had discussion of these things. You seem to get vial curvatures in the generic situations, absolutely going wild, which is what we expect. Vial curvature going wild and collapse, whereas in the Big Bang, it's zero. Now, you see, most people would tend to think that how do you deal with the singularities in cosmology or in black holes? Well, the singularities are places where the curvature gets very, very large. The radius of curvature gets very, very small. Eventually, we get down to the Planck scale of radius of curvature, which tends to the minus 43 seconds, if you like, if you're thinking of times, 20 orders of magnitude smaller than a, than a radio, radius of a proton or something like that, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. And at that scale, you might expect quantum effects dominate. So that's the usual point of view. So the singularities, if you like, in a physical situation would really be dominated by quantum gravity. Now, this is what I believe too, it's a normal belief see, people had, but the puzzle is why is quantum gravity not saying that the vial curvature also is like this too? It's completely different. Vial curvature is very much like the models that we get in cosmology, which are uniform, the, um, the Lemaitre model, for example, of the expanding universe. Is, is very, very uniform, the Tolman models also. So we would expect to see, <clears throat> if it follows the exact models, something with vial curvature zero, which is pretty well what we see. Now, I used to think that it's probably a very strange version of quantum gravity. And I had reason to believe that quantum gravity might be a strange theory because of arguments having to do with um, I was considering the principle of equivalence. This is, this is the famous Galilei principle of equivalence. If you drop a big rock and a little rock, what he imagined from the Leaden Tower of Pisa, and if you imagine that they fall together, he was well aware that if you had no atmosphere, they would fall together. The atmosphere would disturb the picture, but without the atmosphere, they would certainly fall together. And a little insect sitting on the big rock, looking at the little rock, would seem to think that there was no gravitational field. 
and with an astronaut here, I have a futuristic sort of 2001 space station, and the astronaut floating, floating freely does not feel the gravitational force. Gravitational force vanishes um, as you feel, feel, fall freely with it. Now, I was consider that as the, uh, the principle that Einstein picked up on and is based his general theory of relativity was in fact the principle of equivalence. Now here is an argument which I produced to show that the principle of equivalence and the principle of um, superposition in quantum mechanics are really incompatible. And this argument, I won't go into it in detail here, but I imagine here is an, a, uh, an experiment performed on the tabletop and you might consider the Einsteinian, the Newtonian point of view is in the purple coordinates, where you imagine that there is a field. I'm sorry, that's the green coordinates. You imagine that there's a field in your, put a field in your Hamiltonian to represent the gravitational field. That's what most physicists would do. But that's the Newtonian picture. The Einsteinian picture was, you know, you can see the free fall, you choose coordinates which free fall, and then the gravitational field disappears. The difference between these two descriptions is remarkably small. It's just in the phase factor. You might say, who cares about a phase factor? When you look at the phase factor carefully, you see it actually is rather um, troublesome because it involves the time cubed in the exponential, which tells you that you're actually you're looking at a different vacuum. So the Einsteinian and the Newtonian vacuum, vacuum are different. You might not say, well, still, who cares? Just stick to your vacuum and you won't have a problem. The problem arises if you consider two objects in superposition as part of your experiment. So I'm imagining on the tabletop, you've got a lump which is put into a superposition of two locations, and then you are in trouble because when you move around near these lumps, you see that there's a different vacuum with, uh, that is the Einsteinian vacuum that you should be using. There's no problem in the Newtonian picture, but we know we should replace it with the Einsteinian picture. The Einsteinian picture has this T cubed troublesome term, which tells you that as you move around, you're really in different vacua, and that really means you're stuck. Rather than being stuck, I simply took this as a measure of the error, error in, the, in the system. In fact, you integrate the error and you find it turns out to be error in the energy, like this thing I call EG. So it more or less says that there's an uncertainty in the energy of the system, which is inversely related by the Heisenberg time energy uncertainty principle to a time scale. So I say the collapse of the wave function is a feature of trying to put gravity into quantum mechanics. So this, my point of view was that really, yes, maybe it is a funny kind of quantum mechanics to deal with the singularities, but it's got to be a quantum mechanics which modifies, is modified because, because of the gravity effects on quantum mechanics, not by the quantum effects on gravity, which is quantizing gravity, but the gravitational effect on quantum mechanics, which is the gravitization of quantum mechanics, which the argument is which bring the collapse of the wave function into it. I don't want to go into that anymore because I could never do anything with it. It was just my reason for thinking maybe that's the way that you have different. I couldn't still see why it gave you a time asymmetry. And it was really Paul Todd, who was a, initially a graduate student of mine, and he had another way of looking at it. Let me talk about that here. The point of view is that we think of, of the physics more from a conformal point of view. And it's useful. I've been doing this myself for looking at radiation. And it's useful because in a conformal picture, that is to say, you throw away the, the scale of the metric. You just look at the, 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 the ratio of the components, if you like, in the metric. And here we have a nice picture due to the Dutch artist M.C. Escher of a conformal geometry, happens to be hyperbolic geometry, don't worry about that. But in this picture, you see these fish inhabit this, this geometry and it's conformal representation. You see this particularly well with the eyes of the fish, they're circles and they remain circles no matter how close to the edge you get. So although there's a bit of distortion, the angles, the angles on the wings of the fish or the fins or whatever they are, the closer you get to the edge, the angles remain the same. So it's conformal, that means angles are preserved small shapes are preserved, but you could squash them down. And in this Pel Beltrami picture, you get the, uh, or Poincaré disc, as it's sometimes called, Beltrami was first, you see this um, squashing down of infinity, which was very useful to talk about gravitational radiation. I'm not going to talk about that here. So you could sit go out to infinity and examine what the field looks like at infinity, and you can do your calculations much more easily than taking limits. 
What I'm going to do here, well, first of all, talk about conformal a little bit more. It means in your light cones, you, you just have the light cones. You don't necessarily have these surfaces in the light cones, which give you the, the scale. Uh, the scale is given by combining these two most famous equations of 20th century physics, Einstein's equals mc squared, Max Planck's equals h nu, nu is the frequency, combine the two, and you see that, and you see that mass and frequency are equivalent. And this is described here. You have two particles zipping along at different speeds, if you like, and they intersect these surfaces, tick number one, tick number two, if you like. That means one second, two seconds, three seconds, or whatever it is. The time is measured by these surfaces, which are not the light cones. So these surfaces which give you the scale are uh, the additional feature you need to know what the actual metric is. Now, a photon doesn't hit any of them. So a photon doesn't need to know the scale. The photon Maxwell's equations, even just the light rays don't need the scales. It's Maxwell's equations also. They're completely conformal and invariant. You can change the scale different places and different, different by different amounts of different places. And the Maxwell equations, if you write them in the right way, remain completely insensitive to, this, to, the, to the scale. So they are conformal things. That's the important thing I want to make here. Now, the next thing I want, well, it's just the light cones. We don't need the photo. The next picture is what we do now. Now I'm making infinity, squashing it down, just in the Beltrami picture, the Escher Beltrami picture. With a positive cosmological constant, it happens to be space-like. So I have a space-like boundary in the future. Now here's the trick that Paul Todd was suggesting. I was aware that in the general cosmologies, you can stretch it out and make that flat too, make it a finite boundary. But Paul's idea was to say, let us make this the criterion rather than saying the vial curvature hypothesis, which was my idea to say, okay, you just by fiat, just say the vial curvature hypothesis says that in the Big Bang, the vial curvature has to be zero. Why? It doesn't say why. But the version here is saying, no, don't say that. It's, you say that the Big Bang is characterized by saying that when you stretch it out conformally, it is a smooth boundary. Very nice way of doing it, because you can write down equations, and Paul did this. He characterized the geometry very nice in the early stages. So we have this picture. In fact, I want to go further. This is what gets outrageous. It wasn't outrageous before. This is perfectly sensible. This is outrageous. Well, I'm saying it's outrageous just because it wasn't the way people were thinking. What I'm saying is that the stretched out Big Bang is really the continuation of the squashed down infinity of a previous eon. This could be our eon, what we think of as our Big Bang, that's our remote future. And our Big Bang stretched out was the continuation of a remote future of a previous thing. This makes geometrical sense. What about physical sense? Well, it does sort of, because when you squash down the very, very low density, very, very cold remote future, it gets hotter, it gets more dense. When you stretch out the very, very hot, very dense Big Bang, it gets colder and it gets less dense. In fact, they seem to match quite well, just, just on general looking at it. And so it's not such a stupid idea. And if you have massless things in the remote future, you might say massless particles are dominating the, the remote future. And these massless fields, if it's photons, yes, they would. I, um, the Big Bang, you might say, what about the mass of particles in the Big Bang? Well, they hardly count, the mass hardly counts, because when it gets very, very, very hot, the energy is almost entirely in the kinetic motion of the particles, and their mass becomes totally irrelevant. So you could say that effectively their mass is at both ends. It's a bit of a stretch of the imagination, but that is the idea. And it goes further. You can get signals coming across if, if they were certainly low frequency electromagnetic, you could imagine them getting across, but primarily gravitational signals can get across. And in fact, they were idea that uh, you could actually see black hole collisions in the previous eon by looking at signals in the next eon. My colleague uh, Vahe Gurzajan did in fact do this. Here, this previous picture, you see the inter inter interesting thing here. If you have a cluster of galaxies, then this cluster of galaxies will more or less give you concentric rings so that you would actually spot rings here. The idea that Vahe had was that these rings would be of low variance around the ring. When you see them, this is the intersection of our Pascon with these rings, and you would see low variance rings. The signal is not strong enough 
unless you look at at least three of them with the same center. So that's what he did. And what you find is this remarkable picture. This is looking at the Planck data. These are signals of low variance where you're looking at least three rings. So these are three different um, galactic clusters in the previous eon would be the, with the picture that we have. The remarkable thing here is that they are uh, very clumped. The distribution is not uniform at all, whatever they, this thing is explaining. If it's what I think it is, it's explaining the geometry of the previous eon, which is not really very uniform when you consider the distribution of supermassive black holes. In fact, it may be connected with the distribution of quasars in our own eon, which is not uniform either. It's a very interesting feature. The other point is the color code, because the color coding here is complicated because red really means blue shifted and blue, it actually does mean distant. The blue ones would mean within our particle horizon in the normal description. The red ones would be outside our particle horizon. We can see outside the particle horizon because the light cone goes beyond it. Um, but uh, what's striking is that it's clumped also in color, not only in position. So this, the argument would be, this is a relatively close, that is in, within our particle horizon, clumping of enormous uh, distributions of black holes. This one would be in the previous eon. Maybe something to do with the, the cold spot, which is somewhere around here too. I won't go into that. I'll just go into the other thing that had been looked at. This is a paper by Christoph Meisner, Daniel Ann, and um, Pavel Nurovsky, and myself, in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. And we looked at the Hawking points. These are black holes will eventually disappear by Hawking evaporation. This is a picture from the paper. And you see this. This is the crossover from previous eon to us, according to what I'm claiming. This is the world line of a black hole. It spreads out to about eight times the diameter of the moon, according to the standard picture of how much uh, of an event would spread out. Um, and this would be about four degrees across in the sky. And this would be a, a sort of spot, which is hotter in the middle and colder on the outside. Now, uh, we look for these things and we find them with a 99.98% confidence level. Some other people have looked and also have found them without quite realizing what they're seeing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for uh, this very nice talk. We still have some, uh, some time. So are there any questions? Well, I, just had to, I just had to go out the door for a minute. <laughs> ah, okay. Yes. I, I, I was within the time, was I? I wasn't sure. <laughs> yeah, you, we, still, we still have some time. Yes, uh, yes. I didn't realize that. I, I, I started late. I think that was it. Yes. Hmm? I started a bit late, so I wasn't sure. Oh, yes, I see. I have 40 minutes, didn't I? Yes, yes. Well, I can, I, I can illuminate any, any points if people would like clarifications on these things. Yes, let's see if there are any questions. I don't see at the moment, but I have some, so it's fine. Okay, I see one. So from the chat, uh, maybe we, maybe I can read it. Uh, so the question from the chat is, what is the true nature of black hole central singularity? Classical or quantum? Stationary or not? This is the first question. Well, you see, the argument is, who knows? I don't think it's classical. I think probably is quantum, but the trouble is it doesn't do much. You see, if we went into a black hole, we, we would be killed before we'd experience it. Um, the only question that I was considering is that um, if you expect the singularities in the past to be like those in the future, then sure, we would have an effect. Whether they're quantum, I mean, it's an interesting point because you see the, the, the picture you would get would be something like this, this wild singularity here. It's not like that. So what I'm trying to say is that the Big Bang, singular, Big Bang singularity was actually not at all like that. And it's not quantum gravity. So the point I'm trying to make is that quantum gravity, is, there's a certain irony here because one of my 
the person I learned a lot of physics from in, when I was at Cambridge was Dennis Sharma. And Dennis Sharma was a great proponent of the steady state model. So I got very keen on the steady state model. It was very nice. The universe didn't have a beginning and it kept on going forever. Uh, and then when the discovery of the microwave background came along, uh, Dennis, uh, it was one of the few people, he went around lecturing and said, I was wrong. I used to, he used to go lecturing about the steady state model and saying what, what a wonderful model it was. And then when the cosmic microwave background showed that this was just not right, there had to be this early stage in the universe where everything was highly concentrated and this was the big bang. And so he then sh sh shifted his interests to quantum gravity. So his point was, yes, we've got to study quantum gravity to understand the big bang. That's the real thing. The thing is that in a certain sense, I'm saying he was still wrong <laughs> because quantum gravity doesn't give an explanation of what's going on at the Big Bang. That's really the point of my talk. Perhaps I didn't explain it strongly enough. This gives me the opportunity to say that a little bit more forcefully. The way to understand the Big Bang is not through quantum gravity because quantum gravity would be trying to address the picture as, as one would address the, the, the singularities in black holes. So we say, what is it? Are they classical? I don't think, well, eventually you'll get the Planck scale coming in and there'll be quantum things and who knows what goes on because we don't have a theory of quantum gravity, which makes, and that's certainly not a theory which hangs together and is, uh, agrees with observations and things like that. So I don't really think that it's, you see, it's not going to help us much. If it was going to bounce into something, that would be another matter. Because then you could imagine, yes, it's not singular, it would bounce and come out again, but it would come out again, not like uh, the universe that we see, it would come out like this mess. And that wouldn't be much use, unless you have a model, say, which it has this kind of time going the other way around in, in the next, uh, or something like that. It doesn't seem to help very much, because it wouldn't look like our universe. I mean, it's possible that you have, a, you have a bounce from one of these things to one of these things. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. I'm just saying that it doesn't relate to our understanding of our universe in any direct way, because it's certainly not like our Big Bang. Um, whereas, if you take this other point of view, which I'm trying to adopt, uh, put forward here, which is that the way to understand the... the uh, Big Bang is not that way. The way to think of it is really is something actually quite non-singular, so long as you can consider it as conformal geometry. Because its conformal geometry is non-singular and it extends into this previous remote future. Well, that's it might not, not do that. You see, it could extend into something else. You could have a, I think some people like that kind of picture. You could have it to bounce the other way around. It this picture. I prefer because it, you see, if it bounced the other way around, it doesn't really explain why it happened to be this very special state, because it could, could be something else when it was in the past. I don't know, you could take that point of view, I have nothing against it. It's just that I think this point of view is much more promising because there do seem to be observational effects. There's another thing I should mention and didn't previously. You see, you don't have any inflation in this picture. What you do have is a sort of inflation because the previous eon, its remote future is an exponential expansion. So those features which seem to be explained by inflation, the argument here goes, is explained by looking, peering through, if you like, the Big Bang into this previous eon. And this most particularly gives you an explanation of why there is this scale invariance in the temperature variations in the microwave background. Because you, it gives you an explanation if you know where these variations come from. My view is where they come from is the decay of dark matter. If you go into the equations, you find that the thing which makes the equations work when you go from one side to the other is the creation of a whole lot of new material that wasn't there before which is a scalar material which interacts only gravitationally. So I claim this is dark matter. This dark matter starts out very uniformly. It will start to clump when there are other things and galaxies form and so on. It will also decay. 
the decay has to have a half life of something like 10 to the 11 years. If you have a decay with a half life of something like 10 to the 11 years, then in the next eon, let's imagine now the previous one, this eon will have decaying dark matter. This dark matter will produce variations in the temperature, which are scale invariant because of the exponential expansion. So long as you don't have a depletion due to the decay of way of the particles. If there is a depletion, this will cause an effect which is like the, the spectral index. So the spectral index is a feature which is explained in other ways in current physics, that there would be an explanation, which is the depletion of the dark matter due to the decay, which is where I get my figure of something like 10 to the 11 years. That would be just about right, something like that. I haven't gone into the details of this. Just about right in order to get a spectral index of the kind that we see. So that's one thing you might explain. The collisions between galactic galaxies, galactic galaxies, galactic clusters where you have supermassive black holes colliding. One seems to see an effect of that nature with the Varkes discussion, discussion here. A lot of people have complained about the analysis, but, but this is just, you just look at the picture here. There's nothing about the analysis. Uh, it, it's perfectly straightforward and that's what you get. And you have to complain about the picture here, if you like. Um, certainly, it's, th there was a paper, I haven't seen any paper which actually addresses the published paper in the monthly notices here. I've seen people which complain about it before it was published, that is to say an earlier version, which was not the paper which was actually published. I've also seen a uh, paper which sees the same effect that we do, although don't make much noise about it which is interesting too. So it does seem that there is this, these spots. I could make another point is that the spots, if you look at the Planck data and you take the, I'm not sure I trust exactly where they are. I trust the 99.98% confidence, but that's just a confidence level for the signal altogether. It's not a confidence level for the actual <clears throat> positions of the spots. Daniel Ann has gone around and looked at where the spots are and I think once I have less, much less trust in the actual locations of the spots. However, I do trust the, most strong, the strongest five points you see in the Planck data. The reason I trust them is because if you look at the Planck data, you see them in exactly, sorry, if you look, this is, I'm talking about the Planck data. These five strongest spots in the Planck data are seen in exactly the same places in the W data. So that's why I trust them. They're in exactly the same places. There's also a sixth spot in the WMAP data, which is the sixth strongest, I think. And you look at that spot, and it's also in the Planck data. So those six spots I would trust. Moreover, I asked Vahe to look in his data, and here's this picture here. Where do you see those six spots? And do you see them? They would have to be green color, because green represents the spots you see the Hawking points, you would only see them as your light ray just hits them edge on. So you'd only see them when the rings that Vahe would be looking at would be edge on. And so they would have to be not blue, not red, they have to be green. So I asked him, these six spots, where are they? And he looks at the six spots and three of them are, sorry, yes, three of them are actually where you see green rings exactly in those spots. So those three points seem to have supermassive, uh, other supermassive black holes running into them. That would be the explanation according to my scheme. Um, three out of the three that you don't see is green rings probably just didn't happen to have so many collisions with other supermassive black holes. Right. It's just, that doesn't, I, I wouldn't attach too much significance to that, but it's interesting. It would be good to do a more a detailed analysis. I'm just trying to make the point that there are lots of things to do with this picture. Uh, for example, I did mention that the blue region up at the top here would be correspond to galactic clusters in, I mean, in the previous eon, but they would come through to distributions in our eon because as the signal comes through from the past eon to the next one, there would be effects in the next eon. So I think it's quite possible that you might see uh, galactic uh, 
quasars or something. It's interesting that you do find somewhat close to this. I'm, I'm a little puzzled by it. It's about here, I think, about on the edge of the blue region. There is a very large quasar clumping in, it's the very, very, very large quasar clumping. It's the biggest one you find, apparently, in, in, the, in our, I'm talking about now observations within our eon, and we're looking at quasar, clumps of quasar, and, the, and the, there is a really big clumping, which is somewhere here. I'd be happier if it was right in the middle of this region. It's not. It's sort of on the edge of it, which is quite curious. Anyway, I just mentioned these things because I think there's an area here of research, not worth, it's not, uh, of course, within the normal scheme of things. It gives you a different picture from inflation. You'd have to, certainly the things that inflation is supposed to explain, do it, does, you do get an explanation in these things. I don't know all the things about inflation. I'm not really up with it. But certainly the fact that you get um, <clears throat> causal, what is it, causal relations outside the particle horizon or something, that is that is something you would get here because you're looking into the previous eon and that is outside the particle horizon. So there are things like that, which lots of things which should be explored. And I really hope more people would look at it rather than dismissing it as, as uh, maybe something not believable. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for, uh, for, uh, for the talk. And uh, there are actually several other questions, but uh, it's better, I think, to postpone them to the final discussion session. So, okay. yeah. Uh, thanks. Any, right, there is no. Uh, yeah. So can you remind me when the question period is? The question period, uh, what time is it? The question period? It's, uh, so there are two other talks of so 40 minutes. So it's uh, after those two talks, there is the... the... There's two talks, yes, I, I, I have some other... So 80 minutes, so one hour and 20 minutes, and then there is uh, the discussion session. Okay. okay, about an hour and 20 minutes from now. Good, Thank you. Sure.